As we got older and my sister Erica and I became teenagers, mother gave us more responsibility. My sister helped take care of our apartment and the food purchasing, and I worked in the shop where shoes were made and sold. Eventually, they trusted me to purchase their materials at a low price wholesale so that they made a profit. When these materials became rationed, I had to be watchful in order to get everything our coupons allowed. In order to handle our grown up responsibilities, Erica and I had the run of Kiel, a most unusual city. My father had told me that although Schleswig was once the capital of Schleswig Holstein, our hometown had grown rapidly as a Prussian naval city and later as an imperial naval port on the Baltic. He said that Kiel had grown even more at the end of WWWI. The German Revolution began in 1918, with the mutiny of the fleet and the hoisting of the red flags. Our city became the capital after the establishment of the Federal Republic of Germany in 1949. The tides and weather of the Baltic were part of our rhythm, Built along a huge natural bay, our city extended along both sides. We could cross the city on ferries, or go the long way around by streetcar, or on our bikes. The middle class, to which we belonged, as well as the lower working classes, lived in apartment buildings. The upper class had houses, and the aristocrats lived in mansions on large estates. Class divisions were unimportant to me, except that I would have liked to have the privilege of a college education. By August of 1939, I was able to discuss the latest news with my father or my uncle. The Soviet Union and Germany had just signed a non-aggression pact. Finally, said Uncle Honey, some good news for a change. Now we shouldn't have to deal with an invasion from Russia, I said. This is really great. But by September, Hitler was on the radio, screaming, Polish troops have attacked our German radio station in glywitz Silesia." Fire is being returned at this minute. My uncle Hani and I heard him describe the fight. This can lead to no good, uncle said, shaking his head and breathing hard. I was afraid he was going to have an asthma attack. He whispered between coughs. I have never believed anything Hitler says. You realise that World War II has unofficially begun, don't you? He said, as his eyes searched my face for a reaction. He reached out and touched my shoulder too choked up to go on. News from abroad became ever more threatening. France and Great Britain demanded that Germany immediately stop hostilities and withdraw from Poland, or war would follow. Hitler ignored them. After seeing these threats underplayed by the media, Uncle Hani said, Hitler feels so powerful that he doesn't believe that the West will take a stand against his expansion of territory. He is very, very wrong. England and France declare war on Germany, was the headline, September 3, 1939. By the 17th, my father ran upstairs with the daily newspaper under his arm. Divide and conquer was the name of the game. Breathing hard, he shakily spread it out with a shower of cigarette sparks. He pointed out that the Soviet Union invaded Poland from the east. Germany and the Soviet Union divided Poland between themselves. My God in heaven, he said, we're going to be bombed for sure. Within a few weeks, we heard the engines of the Royal Air Force, RF, coming our way. They dropped leaflets with a caricature of Stalin and the mustached Hitler, Kaptioned, the only difference. Stalin, of course he, was a communist. Erika and I ran outside to grab some to show our mother. Mother struggled to say the right thing. These were dropped to scare us. Uncle Hani took a look at the leaflets and looked glum. Ach, he snorted and retreated to his room. The paper drop did not last. Bombs followed. Block captains showed us how to make blackouts every night so that no light would show pilots where the city lay. We covered every window with black paper. The block captains checked their neighbourhoods for any cracks of light showing through. Tenants of every building had to take precautions against incendiary bombs, primarily in the attics under the terracotta tile roofs. Sand and water were stored up there to extinguish these small bombs, which set fires on impact. Every apartment building had to have interfacing walls broken out in order to connect the buildings. This would provide an escape route if the building collapsed. 
Sealed metal doors were installed in case of gas attacks. The entire population was issued gas masks. During my 15th year, British night attacks against Kiel intensified. Our ships attracted them like magnets. Drums that released artificial fog were set up on both sides of Kiel Harbour. There were red alerts and yellow alerts. At yellow alert, enemy planes headed in this direction, they released the fog. However, it was impossible to artificially fog such a massive harbour. The shipyards and naval installations and submarine bases were all situated at the harbour's edge. The loud, boastful statement of Hermann Göring, head of the German Air Force, became a standing joke. My name will become Hermann Meyer if any enemy planes ever cross the German frontier. His troops were commonly referred to as the Hermann Meyer forces. There was far more teasing than anyone today might believe. Everyone made jokes at the Air Force's expense. So you are one of Hermann Meyer's men? They could only smile back. Britain's Royal Air Force gave us headaches. Our family was somewhat relieved when Erica graduated and was assigned to a year on the land. This was Nazi egalitarianism. City kids were supposed to live and work in the country for a year and experience the life of farm kids. In actuality, the Nazis needed the strength of girls and women to substitute for all the farmers they had sent off to war. We missed Erica, but we kept telling each other that she would be safer. Still in school, I was assigned to air raid defence. On duty as an air raid defence boy, I had to stay up all night sometimes to assist during raids. Off duty, I was so tired that air raid sirens couldn't wake me up. When sirens shrieked, everyone was supposed to hurry down to the basement. My mother had her hands full. She would have to shake me awakey and plead with me to go down to the basement. Then she had to help Uncle Hanny down four flights of pitch black stairs. Ach, he would protest. Don't push me. At the first hint of bombings, Mother decided what was essential and had it at her fingertips. She never went anywhere without our documents. We would sit in the dimness with a few candles, praying that our building wouldn't get hit and collapse on top of us. One day we got downstairs just in time to hear a heart-stopping blast and feel a giant concussion. The whole building shook. We grabbed each other's hands, ducked down with our heads together, at least we could die together. Why? Why do we have to suffer so? Uncle Honey said. Hush, Honey, the neighbours will hear you, Mother said. The building ceased trembling. What a tremendous bomb. We waited until the all-clear siren went off before climbing up to survey the damage. The stairway is clear, someone shouted. Let's get out of here, I yelled. I can't stand to look, Uncle Honey said. What did any of us do to deserve this? The blockbuster had landed in the street and had destroyed half of our building. Although our own apartment was intact, the windows were smashed and debris was everywhere. Mother used brushes instead of dust cloths for house cleaning. Her brushes worked better than anything else to clean up shards of glass and hunks of plaster. We nailed blankets over the windows. From then on, we camped indoors. The blockbuster had knocked out the water main, electricity and gas, exactly as intended. A few weeks later, we were invited to move in with a family from Sudeten, who had previously lived in the building and now lived in a dasher-like cottage, called a settler house, in a new suburb. Small individual houses with small plots of land to raise vegetables, chickens and even a pig, were the Nazi idea of a dream for the people. The new place was quite a distance from the end of the streetcar line. With the addition of our family, the household was doubled up and crowded, but it was much safer than our apartment in Kiel. I hated being a permanent guest in someone else's house. I was secretly glad that I had been joined into the Rapid Commandos, a quick reaction force of the air raid defence which lived in local police stations. I visited my family in the afternoons, my mother could not stop worrying about me. Slow to mature physically, I still looked like a little boy. Yet my job was to pull injured and dead people out from under buildings collapsed from bombs and to put out minor fires. We had many yellow alerts that did not turn into the red alerts, 
which meant an actual air raid on Kiel. The general population was unaware of such alerts. Although we had men's jobs, we were still immature and up to pranks. My friend Paul Schultz and I used yellow alerts to our advantage if we wanted to go to school late. We deepened our voices to call in for each other, pretending to be officials, granting excuses. Hello, Officer Schultz here, Paul would say. Ericsson won't be in until ten this morning. His unit was on duty all night. Then we'd crack up and laugh so hard that Paul's face would turn red. His hair, eyebrows and eyelashes were so white that he looked like a junior St. Nicholas. We had been issued new uniforms, consisting of a hodgepodge of former Dutch Army uniforms with German Air Force grey caps. This helped us gain entry into movie theatres for military discounts and to try to avoid age restrictions on grown-up movies. Uniforms seemed to make everyone feel more important. My father's dark blue police uniform had looked perfectly adequate. But when I saw him on the street one day, I thought he had become the police chief. His position had not changed, but he and all of his fellow officers were brilliantly attired in green uniforms with loops of gold braid, epaulettes, multicoloured ribbons and badges. It would have taken a catalogue to figure out all the uniforms worn in Germany at that time, but everyone was frightened of the SS and recognised them immediately. The infamous Heinrich Himmler, head of the SS, was also the head of the German police and the Gestapo, the secret state police. Himmler had decked out the police force in dark green. He geared the outfit he chose for his general SS to overawe the citizenry. Black trousers, brown shirts, black jackets and black jackboots. People dreaded the Gestapo more, even though they didn't wear uniforms. They went about their insidious business-like wolves in sheep's clothing. Richard Briggs, an American army veteran, told me how confused they were about all the German uniforms. The event occurred sometime in mid-March 1945, on the outskirts of Cologne. We could see the steeple of the famous cathedral in the distance. I was an 18-year-old private in the 86th Black Hawk Infantry Division. We were on the front lines. My sergeant sent me to the rear to do something, I forget what, but as I was passing a small cottage in a wooded area, I saw an older man in the most beautiful uniform I had ever seen. There was braid all over it. I thought he must surely have been a German admiral or something, so I took him prisoner. I searched him, found him unarmed, and proceeded to march him to the rear with his arms over his head. From there, I had to march him several miles to a tent at our battalion headquarters to be interrogated by our colonel. It was only seconds until the colonel popped out of the tent and shouted, Where is that dumb G.I. that brought the German admiral in here? He's no German admiral, he's a streetcar conductor. Needless to say, I was the laughing stock of my company then, and I still am when we veterans meet today, 54 years later. Our rapid commando uniforms didn't make life easier for us either. Youth leaders often checked for IDs at movie entrances. They wouldn't let us into adult movies. Youth leader patrols could check identification and had police power over children under 18 unless they were already in the military. I was perplexed by the rules. Weren't they already treating us like adults? My 15-year-old buddies and I were forced to dig bodies out of caved-in buildings and extinguish fires, yet we were prevented from seeing romances on the screen. Bombs falling on German cities did not deter Hitler from his plans to conquer more territories. In 1940, just before I turned 16, he announced over the radio, Germany has invaded neutral Denmark as well as Norway. Due to Dutch resistance, the Luftwaffe is attacking Rotterdam. The Netherlands will soon be ours. Belgium was invaded in order to attack the Maginot Line, a connected line of fortifications in France, from the rear, since their guns were facing only one way. Germany defeated France, which surrendered that June. Germany occupied the northern half, and Marshal Henri Philippe Pétain governed from Vichy and served the Nazi overlords. My family gave me a 16th birthday party at the house in the country. We had so little time together that we clung to one another that night and feasted on food mother had scrounged together. She even managed to give me a cake with candles and wrapped a present for me. 
When I tore it open, I found an expensive Swiss watch. Don't get sentimental over this, my dad said. Now you won't have an excuse for being late. I'm never late, I protested. People complain that I'm always too early. Like father, like son, my father said with a proud smile. My uncle didn't say a word when I unwrapped the leather wallet full of money that he gave me. Tomorrow, said my ever-practical mother, I'll help you open a postal savings account. You never know when money might come in handy for an emergency. That was fine with me. The partners had taught me thrift and how to spend money wisely. They were both conscientious bookkeepers, proud of the fact that they had taught me how to manage money. They could not say the same for my father. He aggravated them every time he wanted to buy something. Instead of asking for a certain amount, he just opened the cash register and took out a fistful of marks. Neither my uncle nor my mother wished to confront him. Instead, they showed me what a mess it made of their system and used it for one more of my learning experiences. In the midst of alerts, bombs and emergencies, children went to school and grown-ups went to work. After graduating from a boys' middle school, I went to a boys' commercial school, where I was being trained in the wholesale business. We took it for granted. Our lives were a continuous round of school and work punctuated by air raids and danger. Although I no longer lived at home, I had no freedom to socialise, nor did anyone else my age. In normal times, parents would plan parties and dances where 16-year-old boys and girls could meet. I'm sure that everyone felt like I did. Our lives were in suspension. Besides the normal three R's, I attended classes in English, accounting and history, Nazi style. We had already learned that there had been three Reichs, or empires. The first was Charlemagne's, the second was Bismarck's, the third was Hitler's Germany. A favourite teacher's question was, how long will the Third Reich last? The correct answer, a thousand years. By April 1941, Hitler gloated over his conquests in every speech. He announced that Germany had attacked Yugoslavia and Greece. By June, he told us, Germany has attacked the Soviet Union with the allied countries of Finland, Hungary, Bulgaria and Romania. After massive attacks caught the Soviet Union unprepared, the German offensive froze up at Leningrad and at Moscow. German forces were unprepared and ill-equipped for the severe Russian winter. Undismayed, Hitler was on the radio in December saying, Germany has declared war on the United States of America after Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. I was sitting with Uncle Hanny at the shoe store, smoking a forbidden cigarette and discussing these new developments. This is going to be the end of Germany, my Uncle Hanny said, holding his head in his hands. Then he put his arm around my shoulders. Neither of us could have guessed how badly it would end, especially for him. By May of 1942, I was drafted into the German army at Ratzeburg. With the invincibility of youth, I said goodbye to my family. They gathered round and tried their best to be positive. My father took a look at my belt buckle and expounded on one of the many ironies and controversies of Nazism and religion. Did you ever compare your belt buckle to the one the SS wears? Our belt buckles in the army were embossed with a German eagle clutching the swastika and surrounded by the words Gott mit uns, meaning God was with us. This differed from the belt buckles of the Waffen-SS, or military units of the SS, whose inscription was Blood and Honour. No, I said, I don't understand it. The Nazis suppress Christianity, but you have a God-fearing belt buckle. But more importantly, the Army, Navy and Air Force have Lutheran and Catholic chaplains, my father said. They'll be there when you need them. The two religious groups were recognised as state churches. My father went on to say that the Vatican had signed a concordat with the Nazis in July of 1933 for the Roman Catholic Church in Germany. Father added that the basic idea was, you stay out of our church and we stay out of your politics. Unfortunately, the Concordat did not protect the Roman Catholics for long, nor were the Lutherans protected. My parents paid close attention to what happened next. The Evangelical Lutheran Church, governed within the States, 
did not have a strong national organization. The Nazis tried to wrest control by appointing a Nazi bishop. At that point, the Lutheran Church splintered into two, a confessing church and the evangelical Lutheran Church. The confessing church opposed the Nazi doctrine. Pastor Bonhoeffer bravely led the confessing church until he was arrested and executed. Another Lutheran, Martin Niemöller, a World War I submarine captain and later a Lutheran minister, took over the leadership and ended up in a concentration camp for his resistance to Hitler. Our family discussed these issues and silently prayed for the souls of the pastors. Suddenly, I was on my family's prayer roster too. Their entreaties surrounded me with love on my 50-mile trip to army basic training in Tunda, Denmark, the catapult to far-off theatres of war. The war that Hitler started in Poland had spread through 61 countries on four continents before ending six years later, with 50 million people dead. I was lost in thought until the bus jerked and jolted over potholes and around piles of debris. Fog had rolled in and descended in a cold haze. An icy chill seized me as I wiped off a spot on my window and laid eyes on a grey, rubble-covered city. My hometown. Repatriation amidst devastation. The occupation, a conglomerate of the victorious countries of England, France, the Soviet Union and America, now governed Germany. They adjudicated boundaries to divide Europe and later called it the Iron Curtain. The curtain stretched from the Baltic Sea across Germany. Then the Soviets built the Berlin Wall that split the city into eastern and western sectors and formed a barricade between neighbourhoods and families. Relatives were no longer able to see each other. The state of Schleswig-Holstein and the city of Kiel fell on the western side and were governed by the British. The postal bus carrying me home thumped over ruts into Kiel. When the driver announced my stop, Ella Becker marked, I hopped off, totally discombobulated. I could just as well have been on the moon. Where was the cross and belfry of the church? Where were all the linden trees? Piles of rubble lay everywhere. Eighteen large-scale carpet bombings had pulverised more than 58% of all dwellings. Here was the result of that debacle. As I stumbled through the jagged mass of bricks and concrete, I felt as if I danced a requiem for the souls beneath. When I got my bearings, I started thinking about letters my mother had written as I walked to our family's apartment. She had brought me up to date during my last year of captivity. Her letters were always upbeat, regardless of how bad things were at home. She told me that the apartment by the harbour that they moved to from the country was also bombed. Thanks be to God, she wrote, about three quarters of the building is still standing, although all of the glass windows were shattered. When your tall Uncle Hans came to see us, he vaulted right through the living room window. We were so happy to see him. Hans says he spent most of his army service on the island of Crete until the surrender. Unlike you, he was only a POW for a few months. Hans helped me locate sheets of plexiglass and he nailed it in the window frames. As I walked, I could hear the fluttering and crackling of hundreds of synthetic windows in the wind. Every building and every tree I passed bore scars of war. Streets and sidewalks were full of huge obstacles created by bombs. I had to keep dodging craters, chunks of cobbles and boulders of concrete. My heart sank. What would my parents' living conditions be like? I already knew about the prevailing food shortages. One of mother's letters had answered my question about the food rationing. Yes, it's still very hard to get enough food. Your aunts and I share what we have. Don't worry, your father and I are all right. All we are really concerned about is you and your sister, Erica. We just wait for the happy day that you and Erica come home. Rationing did not affect my father nearly as much as it did my mother, because of his job. When he was on duty, he was served meals at the police station. For others, rationing was based on minimum caloric needs of men, women and children, and whether or not you were working. After the family shoe shop was bombed out, their food coupons were cut down. Mother had somehow survived on her bare minimum, supplemented in the warm months with what she could grow in a plot in the backyard. When foodstuffs were available, 
Weekly post-war rations for the average worker were 100 grams of meat, 50 grams of margarine or butter, 150 grams of bread, about three spoonful of sugar and the same of jam, a little oil or fat, and a few potatoes. When I calculate this today, 28 grams is equal to one ounce, I realise how resourceful she was to stay alive. She had written, Don't worry about me. The old lady across the street showed me a lot about wild plants. Your aunties and I find wild herbs and edible roots. We make tea from wild chamomile and rose hips. They're full of vitamin C, you know. We pick dandelions and other wild plants to make into salads and cook them as vegetables. The ladies and I take turns going to the fish market. One benefit of living on the Baltic Sea was that fish were not rationed, and the commercial supply not gobbled up by the government was sometimes available to keelers. Mother had coped with air raids, malnutrition, my uncle Hanny's depression and death, and the anxiety of not knowing whether Erica and I were alive, mistreated, or dead. My sister was in a Women's Army Corps anti-aircraft unit stationed on the island of Rugen until the Russian advance. Unknown to my parents, Erika's unit outmaneuvered the Russians and made it to Bavaria, where the Americans briefly held them as POWs. Erika was permitted to contact my mother. Erika will be home soon, my mother wrote. The war is over for Erika, I thought. When will mine ever be over? Mother's letters were surprisingly optimistic. She never brooded about our sacrifices. She shared her worries and anxieties by visiting with a small group of relatives and neighbour women with the same uncertainties, depressions and deaths. Even though I miss you, it is probably best that you are not here right now, she had written. From reports of POWs, I knew that Mother's life had been in constant jeopardy because the shipyards were just across the street from our apartment. Air raids with bombing and strafing planes had hit the docks day and night. When the sirens went off, she had to grab her briefcase of documents and head for one of the huge concrete bunkers built some time after I left. Mother said that father was seldom there to help her, since he worked double and even triple shifts. My father added a postscript to one of her letters. I thought you would like to know what happened to your cousin Heinz. After Heinz came back from the Legion Condor in Spain, he was promoted. He was sent to Russia as the leader of a motorised signal unit. The unit was on its way to the front when Heinz heard over the radio that the Russians were surrounding them. Screw the orders, he said. Let's get out of here. They turned around and drove their signal truck back to avoid capture. Heinz never had to spend one day as a POW. He's a very lucky guy. Heinz was home safe and sound, and that was all that mattered, even if the news made me more homesick. In another letter, Mother wrote that her cousin Frieda, who lived upstairs, had been pregnant. Even though I was happy for Frieda, it couldn't have happened at a worse time. She gathered donations of food from friends, relatives and neighbours to get enough for the higher caloric needs of Frieda. Fortunately, the pregnancy was uneventful. Medical assistance could not be counted on. Mother wrote, When Frieda's baby was born, I helped with the birth. It happened at night, in an air raid bunker during a raid. There weren't any problems, and the baby is normal. Her name is Elka, and she has bright red hair. The infant owed her good start in life to the fact that my mother and other noble souls shared their food with her mother during the pregnancy and during the nursing period. For the rest of her life, Elka had a special place in the hearts of the close, loving relatives and neighbours who had worried over her development throughout the food shortages. She was more they ever hoped for. Elka was what they called an old soul, an exceptionally perceptive, intelligent and considerate child. Mother's midwifery and food-gathering skills were needed again later for her own daughter. She had written me a joyous letter. Your sister finally came home, black with soot from head to toe. They sent the women's army unit back in coal cars. I was glad that Erica had given them something to laugh about. All she wants right now is to find a husband, get an apartment and have a baby. Then she will feel normal, mother wrote. Erica was 28 years old by then. Although there were few eligible men left in her age group, 
Erica fell in love with and married Helmut, a man twice her age, and had a baby girl, Helga, whom the family doted on. Out of the gloom, death, and destruction came another healthy, happy, innocent child. Even though they were further challenged to get enough food, clothing, and other basic necessities, the baby was just what they had needed to cheer them up. I was remembering her letters as I rang the doorbell. My father happened to be off duty at that moment. He answered the door. My son, at last. My tough father hugged me and cried. My mother heard the commotion and came running. Now we were all hugging and crying. After we calmed down a little, she said, We have to send someone to tell Erica. We have to let her know that Heino is here. I felt a pang in my heart when I realised that I was waiting for Uncle Honey to come out of his room. I miss Uncle Honey, I said. So do I, son, every day. Mother was so gaunt that she looked ten years older, once she had been fashionable. Now her shabby clothes flapped around her body. She must have seen my worried glance. Excuse the way I look. This is probably the same outfit I was wearing when you left. Garment factories stopped manufacturing years ago. I've renovated my wardrobe by taking my clothes apart, reversing them, and sewing them back together with the inside out so that the worn places don't show. She twirled around like she didn't have a care in the world. Everybody's doing it, she said. Right now, I'm so happy I don't care, and neither should you. Regardless of the extreme food shortage, mother had savoured cannered food for the day I would come home. She warmed up a vegetable stew and got me comfortable and relaxed it for the first time in ages. Suddenly, a question popped into my mind. Where are my clothes? I can't stand to wear this ugly black uniform anymore. I'm sorry, they were packed in a box and torn to pieces when that bomb hit the building, she said. They wouldn't fit now anyway, you've grown much taller. I can't believe it. The clothes on my back are all I have. Will I never get out of uniform? Maybe your father knows where you can get some clothes, she said with a wink. The next day, Dad came home with a package. He had found a green policeman's raincoat to keep me dry in Keel's incessant showers. But I noticed that whenever I wore it, people thought I was with the police and shied away from me. Except for the coat, Father couldn't help me. The only clothing available was sold on the black market. I can't take you there, but I can tell you where it is, my father said with a crooked smile. I appreciated the fact that he made an exception for me, even though he had to struggle with his conscience. The shortages had brought out the worst in some Germans and the best in others, like my mother. Noble, resilient souls, such as she had cooperated and shared what little they had had since the beginning of the war. For their mutual survival, they honed their bartering skills to perfection and never lost their good manners. Dishonest, selfish types who found ways to wheel and deal with the coupons and stolen goods ran the black market and hoarded items the rest of us needed. If you were upper class or wealthy, none of this mattered. You could get anything you wanted. German workers only received 100 to 150 Reichsmarks a week. Black market prices were 100 times as high as regular prices. Ironically, the unofficial currency was our former enemy's luxury product, the American cigarette. One pack equaled 100 marks. I was fascinated to finally see the black market I had heard so much about. Before we left the United States, we were allowed to send a Red Cross parcel home with coffee, cigarettes and soap, all scarce items right after the war. The packet I sent had arrived long before my return home. There it sat, holding the equivalent of a month's wages in bartering possibilities. A carton of cigarettes could be exchanged for a man's suit if you could find a suit. Several blocks along one particular street was frequented by black marketeers who displayed their wares on cardboard or boxes. The vendors always kept a wary eye out for police raids. When police appeared, the vendors would run to doorways or into ruins sometimes leaving their goods behind. After several strolls along the black market, I found a suit and exchanged it for a carton of cigarettes. I took it home and tried it on. Man, this thing is ugly. I hated both the colour and the fit. But anything is better than wearing a uniform. 
Now that my immediate need was met, I intended to take a long rest and to visit my cousins and classmates. Most of my older relatives and nephews and nieces had survived the war. But when I asked my mother about my classmates, I had a terrible shock. Do you know if Georg is back? I asked my mother. Georg lived in our old neighbourhood. We had gone to school together. No, I'm sorry. I saw his mother on the street one day, and she told me that he was killed in Russia. What about Paul? Is he back? He and I had played a lot of silly pranks and called school with excuses for each other when we were in the civil defence. Mother looked out the window at the rain. Umbrellas bobbed up and down past the window as people walked home from work. She pulled up a chair and folded her hands in her lap. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but when I finally got a letter from you last year, I looked up one of your old schoolmasters, hoping for information about your classmates so that I could send you news of them. He told me that none of your classmates lived through the battles. They were sent to the Russian front, where they died from exposure or were killed. I had looked forward to seeing them again. I wanted them back. I wanted our old way of life back. Nothing was the same anymore. Mother put her arms around me. She was crying. I had a loss that I didn't want to tell you about when you were imprisoned my cousin Gertrude across the hall. When her husband Anton came home from the war, he was not himself. What happened to him was he in Russia too, I asked. No one knows. He never told anyone what happened to him while he was gone. Anton was always such a nice man. But when he returned, he was so angry and bitter that Gertrude felt like she was living with a stranger. Anton only came home once in a while for meals. Where did he go? Why didn't he stay home with her after she waited for him so long? No one knows that either. I could tell she was depressed. I tried everything I could think of to try to bring her around, but her marriage problems and her struggle for enough food were too much for her. She committed suicide last Christmas. I was the one who found her. Oh God, does Anton still live here? I asked. Yes. He goes to the cemetery every day to visit her grave. He's on some kind of medication. He tells everyone he's crazy. We watched the rain splash on the window box and cried over our losses until we could cry no more. Mother got up and made tea. She let the tea steep a while before saying, You do have one friend left? Remember Harold? I did, but we never had much in common. I went to see him that night anyway. On my walk over to his mother's apartment, I remembered his anger when the army rejected him because of his tuberculosis. His family was less well off than ours, which was probably why he had TB in the first place. His schooling was interrupted several times when he was sent off for treatment at sanitariums in the cold mountain air. Harold was surprised to see me. He asked me into their humble abode and said, I wish they would have bombed this place, then we could have a nice apartment. I looked at his mother and thought, you can't mean it. Harold had never known the fear of battle or the anxiety of imprisonment, yet he was far angrier and more agitated than me. From my point of view, he was well off. He was healthy now and employed as an engineer. While his good-natured mother served us tea, Harold fussed and complained about the brainless management of his department and the idiotic way that the British were restoring the city. When I got home, I exploded. What's the matter with Harold? Hem doesn't know how lucky he is. He's a perfectionist. He wants everything his way. He's always been like that. His mother told me that he wears expensive English bathrobe to their outwar privy, mother said with a smile. At least we have plumbing that works. My visit to my old friend made me feel worse. How could he ignore the suffering around him? My face must have shown it. I'm so grateful that you and Erica lived through the war and came back without serious mental or physical injuries. I don't care about Harold or anything else, Mother said, in a gentle reminder of priorities. Germany is in worse shape than I imagined. How will we ever recover? I wondered. Today, returned POWs such as myself would probably be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and treated at a veteran's hospital. 
Back then, we had to come to grips with losses of friends, relatives, and the destruction of our homeland. We were supposed to get back to work as if nothing had ever happened. I felt morose. The endless rains and fogs of Kiel did nothing to assuage my angst. On the first Sunday, I was home. Uncle Willie came to visit. Fortunately for him, he never risen high enough in the Social Democrats to be arrested by the SS. Willie was bone-thin, bent, and prematurely aged, but he had not lost his fire over politics. When I heard him getting worked up over government policies again, I realised how much he and Uncle Hani had influenced me. They had never kowtowed to the Nazis. Their independent voices echoed in my head during my years as a soldier and a prisoner. Because they didn't swallow everything they heard, I didn't either. Willie and Mother talked about the damage to our old neighbourhood. Nothing had been rebuilt. People are still living in the undamaged parts of our old building. I didn't tell you yet about St. Matthew's Church, Haino. A bomb hit the roof, fell to the floor below, and completely burned out the interior. Images of the cross, pipe organ, hand-carved altar, pulpit, and the pews we once inhabited flitted through my mind. Once it was our sanctuary, now it was ashes. I don't know if it will ever be restored, Mother said. People don't go to church like they used to. The thought of the destruction of that beautiful old church, as well as our depressing situation, gave me a headache. Hitler's epoch was far from over. I need some air. Let's go for a walk. We headed toward a neighbourhood park. I was surprised to see a lot of stumps. What happened to those trees? I asked my dad. They've been gone for a long time now, he said. Several winters ago, when a coal shipment didn't arrive in the city, no one could heat water or cook, let alone heat their apartments. I told your mother, I hate to tell you this, but the trees are disappearing from the city parks. We haven't been able to catch anybody in the act. He scrunched up his forehead in a frown. I could tell that he was working up to something unpleasant. Before the trees are all gone, I told her, get the able-bodied neighbours together so that we can take our share. So I stood there like a sentinel in my police uniform while they cut down and made off with a tree. After that, when the coal shipments failed, we went back and got another one. I tried to hide a smile. I could hardly believe that my father had broken the law. In Germany there was a law to cover every contingency, and he knew every one of them. All of our relatives poked fun at him behind his back because of his fondness for quoting laws. As children, Erica and I mimicked him by making up new laws and telling each other, you can't do that. According to Section D, Article 8, throwing paper airplanes or paper dolls off the balcony on Sundays is not permitted. There should have been a law against making newly released captives go right back to work. After a week back home, Mother said, Hey no, you're going to have to report to the labour office. Registering for work was a requirement to get ration coupon books. I don't want to get a job so soon, I said. My mind and body cried out for rest. You must. I need your ration card to get enough food for you, Mother said. Ration cards were issued to every man, woman and child in both Germany and America during the war, although America's rations were much more generous. Cardholders were eligible for a booklet issued each month with coupons for each product, including coffee. Germans loved their coffee, and my family was no exception. Coffee stimulated us to get moving, no matter how thin and tired we were. The German government made a concession to the inhabitants of heavily bombed cities and distributed real coffee. Kiel was one of them. The rest of the citizenry got ersatz coffee made of roasted grain. Ration booklets were as necessary as money in our carpet country. Even though my mind said no, I dragged my body to the dreaded labour office. Former POWs were already standing in line. I learned that my fate had by no means been the worst. Russia had sent some of the POWs home when they were starving, close to death, and unable to work. Against all odds, they recovered. They told their terrible personal stories and swapped rumours. 
a skinny little guy in an old ragged uniform said, Tell the officials when you get a work assignment that you don't have any clothes except what you're wearing. Then you don't have to take the job. I don't know where he got that information. Perhaps the Labour office took pity on the abused POWs from Russia and gave them a well-deserved rest. I waited in line for my work assignment. When my turn came, I looked at the well-nourished official across the desk. Years of frustration and anger welled up in me. Impulsively, I asked, where did you spend the war? Instead of the subdued, obedient German boy I had been when I left, I was snotty and sarcastic. I pointed at his jacket and blurted out, I think I can see the spot where you wore the golden German Nazi party badge. What a fiasco! I could tell from his reaction that I was destined to work on a road gang again. He assigned me to a crew that removed rubble and shoved it on loading cars. Temporary narrow tracks for these cars had been laid down all over the city and led to the harbour where the contents were dropped onto barges. Then they were emptied into the Baltic Sea. This was a job for machines, not men. I felt totally discouraged and deflated. After using my wits to get out of road gangs in America, I had come full circle and faced hard labour again. I had gotten too cocky on my home ground. Why didn't I just shut up? That same day, another POW told me a rumour that the British Labour Office was looking for an English speaker. Boy, I hoped it was true. I raced over there at top speed and applied. Mr Thompson, a retired Royal Air Force Group captain, interviewed me. His rank was equivalent to a US colonel. He was now the British resident officer in charge of almost all activities in Kiel, the new state capital of Schleswig-Holstein. He and his staff had a formidable job. A diorama of the city would demonstrate the problem most clearly. Kiel's major roads, city streets, bridges and railways were destroyed, as well as over half of the apartments and houses. Trucks spasmodically distributed the meagre food supply. A steady influx of refugees from former German areas such as East Prussia, Pomerania and Silesia settled in Kiel. Former foreign labourers and POWs who did not want to return home and live under communism squatted in refugee camps for displaced persons. The newcomers doubled our population and exacerbated the problem. The British had taken on the responsibility to dole out living space and food equally, and at the same time, get the city to function again. Mr Thompson was up to the task. The epitome of a British officer and a gentleman he was tall, slender, and wore a moustache. He told me that his eye was blinded in one of the air battles he fought during World War I. In World War II, he lost a son in combat. The interview felt fairly comfortable, since I had been dealing with British officers in less favourable circumstances. Hoping to impress the decorous Mr Thompson, I told him about my POW experience in America and in Scotland. Our talk rangered over the history of Kiel and the political situation. When he told me, I'm hearing you as a translator for the British Control Commission for Germany, I couldn't have been happier. Mr Thompson pulled himself up to his rigid posture as I rose to leave. His one good eye looked at both of mine as he said, Ericsson, do get rid of that awful American accent. That was a tall order. I was fast talker with a German pseudo-southern accent. When I reported for work the next day, I tried to wrap my tongue around my old British accent.